Hi everyone, I'm Tom Wormuth. I'm Vice President for Academics here at Marist College. And I want to take the opportunity to welcome everyone here today to this inaugural uh, event of, a, of the inauguration of our new president, uh, David Yellen, who I see right there in the sixth row uh, in the corner. Um, now there's a whole weekend of activities which we are starting here and uh, you know it's very customary at inaugurations of uh, new presidents as the president is inaugurated in to have not only the major ceremony which will be taking place tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon, but also to highlight what the school, the institution, the university does in the area of research, customary to have symposia, colloquia uh, during the course of uh, the week leading up to it. Uh, although you could do research, uh, focus on the research of really anything that faculty is doing, and many of our faculty are engaged in research, there are a couple of themes that we highlighted during the course of uh, this event, um, which you would have the program on. Everyone should have a copy of the program. Of course, one on technology, something so important that is done here at Marist, disruptive technology, and that is the next session at 3.30. Of course, this session is also on something very important that happens at Marist, social justice, and the Marist and the reform tradition. So the presentations which we are going to hear will focus on that theme. Different, very different fields being represented, uh, uh, very different uh, areas of focus, but in fact all kind of connected together by that theme. I also want to remind everyone that while, not while this is going on, because you're here for the session, but of course the student posters uh, right outside uh, across the hall look wonderful and there'll be a time uh, at the break, the session is going to end about 3, 310. Uh, and also after the uh, next session. So please take the opportunity to walk right across the hall if you haven't done so already, or do so again uh, to view some of the excellent undergraduate work, which are uh, our undergraduates, uh, excellent scholarly research work that our undergraduate students are uh, doing here. Now everyone, again, does have a copy of uh, the program, so I'm not going to go into the rich detail that the program has in terms of the uh, biographies of our uh, speakers, but I'm just going to set out the uh, context of the discussion. Um, e each speaker has already agreed to uh, <laughs> uh, uh, take about five to seven minutes to talk about their research. Um, we're going to basically go in the order that we uh, see here, going right down the uh, line. Uh, my role as moderator is twofold, to make sure they don't go over the seven minutes, because otherwise we'll have some trouble later. There, there are seats uh, all, all over. Um, the, right after that, as moderator, I'm going to uh, throw a question or two to them to kind of elaborate on uh, some of the thoughts that they have uh, put forward. And then the last part of the uh, session, the last 15 minutes or so, I want to open it to questions from the audience, and hopefully we can, we can address those. But let me uh, just take a moment to um, uh, introduce. I'm going to introduce them all in one shot and then go again back to them. Right to my left is Brother Sean Salmon. Uh, Brother Sean is not only on the Marist College Board of Trustees, just had a, a board meeting this morning, but he also was from 2001 to 2009 the Superior General of the Marist Brothers, where he oversaw more than 4,000 Marist Brothers during uh, that decade. He's also published some 10 books and numerous articles on a variety of uh, uh, different subjects. He will be our first presenter, but I just want to quickly go in order just so everyone although you should all have pictures as well uh, in your program. Uh, professor Joseph Campisi, assistant professor of philosophy, his research who is going to be talking on food justice is his subject. Uh, his research focuses on philosophical issues pertaining to food, especially regarding food technology and food politics. Melissa, I'm sorry, Adrian Conyers, no, uh, no, no, right no, to Melissa. his left. I was following the pictures here. Uh, assistant Professor of Criminal Justice, and we'll be talking on the uh, subject of uh, criminal uh, justice. Uh, to his left, uh, Melissa Geike is Professional Lecturer in Political Science, the Director of the Center for Civic Engagement and Leadership here at Marist, that center which reaches out to the larger community and works with our faculty here. And all the way down at the end of the panel there is Joc Jocelyn uh, Smith-Lee, uh, Assistant Professor of Psychology, and she'll be talking about violence and loss. So just to get things going, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Sean okay. to begin. Good. Thanks, Tom. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my role is rather simple. It is to set the historical and global context for our discussion about Marist mission. And I wanted to start with Marcel and Champagne. The dormitory just to the end of this building is named after him, and he was the founder of the Marist Brothers. Marcel was a sheep merchant. 
before he became a priest. And he was a person who was very practical. He grew up in France after the French Revolution and very much embraced the tenets of the revolution, of freedom, equality, liberty, uh, and fraternity, for lack of a better term. Uh, Marcelin also, though, began to realize that, with, as with every revolution, it leaves in its wake devastation often. And one of the areas that was completely devastated was the area of education. Uh, just by way of example, a report from the Loire Valley in France during this period described teachers of the period as, quote, drunkards, irreligious, immoral, the dregs of the human race. I don't imagine you'd want to declare yourself a teacher on your resume if you lived in that particular period. <laughs> and another report from the same region had this to say. It said, the young people are living in the most profound ignorance and are given to the most alarming dissipation. So Marcelin began a movement, uh, which was originally called the Marist Brothers, but part of a larger movement called the Marist Movement, to really bring education to rural country children who were denied any education at all and often had the worst teachers, which is very similar to what happens in the inner city in many of our, our uh, cities in the United States today. Marcelin's approach was this. He said, to teach young people, you must love them first and love them all equally. And he developed what was called the simultaneous method of education, which was a, a form of education that came into France after the French Revolution. He came from a Christian tradition, and brothers will often say that Marcelin's Christianity was practical. It was action-oriented, so that Marist institutions were set up to change the world, not necessarily to publish research. If we look at the project today, the Marist Project Worldwide, of which Marist College is one part of it, there are 3,500 I mean, uh, 3, Marist Brothers Worldwide working alongside another 40,000 women and men serving 650,000 young people <laughs> in Marist institutions and projects around the world each year. There's a presence in 80 countries and on every continent with the exception of Antarctica. When you look at some of those works, they're geared towards social justice. There are approximately 30 Marist universities. They run the gamut from small community colleges to large universities of 30,000 students with medical schools, schools of law, schools of engineering but they're geared again at changing social reality. There are numerous elementary and secondary institutions, childcare centers, refugee centers. I'll say in a moment, we have a refugee center currently in Aleppo, which is under bombardment at the, at the, at the present moment. There's cooperative work also with the Marist Missionary Sisters in the fight against human trafficking. And human trafficking, we know, is a major problem today. In Europe, I lived in Europe for 16 years, and. One year, The Economist reported that in that year alone, 450,000 women and children have been trafficked from Eastern to Western Europe for sexual purposes. The exploitation of children around the world is really out of control at the current time. We also have a seat before the United Nations Human Rights Council lobbying on behalf of the rights of children with an office in Geneva. And we have the same status as any government would have bringing that cause to the United Nations. Now, if you look at the focus of the Marist mission, there's a Marist guide to education, and it raises two points very clearly. It says, in the same way that Marcelin was thinking especially of the least favored of young people in founding the Marist Brothers, our preference is to be with those who are excluded from the mainstream of society. Or, if we're not in that situation, to direct people to service of people on the, who are outside the mainstream, people on the margins and those whose material poverty leads them to be deprived also in relation to health, family life, school, and education and values. In 1976, at one of our international meetings reoriented our institute towards service to the poor. It also pointed out that we need to be constantly alert to the evolving social and cultural forces that have a profound influence on the self-perception of young people and on their spiritual, emotional, and physical well-being. So there's a sense that our, our target is young people, our focus is social justice, and it's particularly aimed at the poor and alleviating the plight of the poor. Just a few examples I thought might help to illustrate this. If you take the city of Aleppo in Syria, we have maintained a presence there throughout the war. We run a school and a refugee camp in the city. 
Uh, and with a little bit of irony, the government announced the other day, with the current bombardment of the city, schools are closed this week. Uh, the city is being devastated by both government and rebel forces. Uh, but the, the brothers and Lay Maris working there felt it was essential to remain in the city with people, which is something that our Constitution encourages. If we move for a moment to the African continent, on the African continent, which is, which is a marvelous continent that people don't understand in this country, many co countries in Africa have magnificent cities that are like New York or Chicago, and also have the kind of poverty that we have in this country, like in, uh, in some places in the south, in Appalachia, for example. But on the, in the African continent, we're working in many areas. One is in reconciliation with the Islamic world. We've established libraries in Oran, Algeria, for the use of Islamic and Christian students to help build a spirit of reconciliation. One of our brothers was assassinated in this project on the Day of Reconciliation. If you're going to do this kind of work, it's risky. We work with boy soldiers. These are young people who are often kidnapped by troops. They're eight, nine, ten years of age, put on the front lines. Often they're sent back to their village to kill their parents and family so they can never return home. When these conflicts are over, where do these kids go? It's, an, it's a a human tragedy today, boy soldiers. We're also involved in projects bringing fresh water wells to villages in Malawi, and I'm pleased to say there were two Marist graduates who were central to that project, raising money for that particular uh, cause. By the way, 80% of well of pumps put in uh, in, in uh, Africa by government and non-government organizations do not work because they're too complicated for people to fix and too expensive. So this is a project bringing very inexpensive pumps we also recently built a school in the midst of a prison housing 2,600 young men in Lilongwe, Malawi. Up to that point, the prison had no resources for those incarcerated. On the African continent during the 1990s, we had 11 brothers assassinated, five from Rwanda, six European. Here's an illustration of some of the work. In the upper left-hand corner, that was a village school, and the government would not provide any better accommodations. It was a mud building. If you move just below it, that was a typical classroom, just humps of dirt on the floor for young children. The picture on the other side is a school we've just built with money from our general government and with a grant from the United States province of the Marist Brothers. We're currently raising money to build housing for teachers because if you can offer housing to teachers, you get better teachers for the schools. If we move then just quickly to uh, Cambodia, uh, in Asia, we're running a number of projects. We're in every, just about every country in uh, Asia, including the People's Republic of China, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, etc. But in uh, Lavala, in uh, near Phnom Penh in Cambodia, we established a school for handicapped street children. Uh, after the Khmer Rouge devastated the country, and if you've not read or seen the Killing Fields, which describes that the devastation that the government brought to the country, a lot of children with disabilities ended up on the street. So we set up a uh, school there. This is the only government-approved school in the country providing a full primary education to children with physical disabilities. And again, I'm pleased to say that on November the 1st, two Marist graduates from 2015, Mike Duffy and John Herman, left to do six months volunteer work in this school. They both work for Ernst & Young, who gave them six months leave to do this project. Uh, so, in summary, what I'm saying is that if you take the Marist mission worldwide, this is a mission that could change the world. It's geared towards bringing justice, it's based on religious principles, and it's aimed at young people. And this college is part of that larger mission. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Brother Sam. I'm gonna Viewing that in terms of um, the moving out from the community and thinking about, as we move to the left, um, what's going on within the, within the community, within the classroom itself on food justice, Professor Campisi? Yeah, so uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming and for this opportunity. So uh, I work in the area that's called the philosophy of food, and it's basically a sub-branch of philosophy where we focus on uh, questions that arise regarding how we eat. Uh, what we eat. Uh, probably the most familiar examples would be if we were to have a debate on vegetarianism, whether it's ethical to eat uh, non-human animals. 
That's a debate that comes up uh, in the philosophy of food. Uh, if we were to have a debate regarding uh, genetically modified organisms, whether it's ethical uh, to practice that, that would be uh, a debate that comes up in my area. I don't personally uh, focus on issues like that. Uh, my background is in an area of philosophy called existential phenomenology, which is going to be the, those will be the longest words I'll use today. But uh, <laughs> what we do in uh, phenomenology is we try to kind of uh, sit back and reflect upon uh, the way that we live, our kind of uh, everyday practices, our lived environment, uh, in a way to kind of see how that impacts uh, ourselves, our relationship to others, uh, our relationship, say, to nature. And so what I look at in my work is not, say, a specific practice like eating animals or a genetic modification. Uh, I look at, say, our food system. So I have, here's my technology. It's the original PowerPoint, but here we go. <laughs> so uh, what this is going to represent for you uh, is this is the, uh, the food system. So, and what I mean by here is everything that's involved in producing uh, food. So uh, uh, from growing crops into the on the fields, uh, animals uh, being raised uh, in feedlots, um, uh, plants producing synthetic uh, uh, chemicals and fertilizers, uh, processing plants where they're making, say, uh, Campbell's soup, all of the things that go into to producing uh, food for us. Um, now, what happens, say, uh, with us today, for many of us, is the food system that describes um, the food that we eat uh, is a global food system so that uh, these processes here are happening uh, all around the world. It's all kind of interconnected. Um, and these are very, very large scale systems, right? Uh, it might be the case that uh, in different points in history or different people living in different parts of the world today, their food system is going to look uh, very, very, very different. But one of the things that's interesting about the global food system, and this is our system today, is that we don't see any of this, right? So we really don't see. Uh, where the farms, uh, uh, people who are growing our food, uh, we don't see, say, the people who are picking our food. We don't see uh, the people working in uh, processing plants, processing our food. Uh, we really don't see uh, the people uh, working in plants uh, producing, say, Campbell's soup. And so really what's happening with us is if the end point is the food that we eat, then this is all that we're kind of exposed to, right? We're exposed to the very, very end of the food system. So this would be, say, the apples that you get in Hannaford, or the uh, uh, chicken, or the uh, ground beef. And so as an existential phenomenologist, what I kind of try to explore is what happens, right? What is our lived experience when our interaction with food is simply with this kind of end product? Now, one of the benefits of this global food system, uh, maybe benefits in quotes, is that it's able to produce incredible amounts of food for a cheap economic price. Uh, and that's why when you go to Hannaford and you can get, say, a ground beef for 99 cents a pound, uh, this is the system that kind of produces it. But what's happening is, is because all of these things in the background are kind of invisible to us, there might be other costs involved that we don't see. Right? And so one of the things then, say, as a phenomenologist that I kind of look at is, how do we relate to the food that we eat? What are, say, the benefits of that system? And what are the losses from it? And it could be something as simple as this. So, um, you know, uh, take, say, the difference between the lived experience or the difference between uh, opening up, I don't mean to pick on Campbell's, but we can use Progresso, I don't care, right? Uh, <laughs> opening up a can of Progresso soup, right? Uh, warming it up and uh, eating it. And there's certain benefits, fairly cheap, very, very efficient. Um, but then what is the difference between that experience and then the lived experience, say, of making your own food from scratch, say. Right? And as a phenomenologist, I kind of look at that and see what are the benefits and then what are the costs. Right? And I think that one thing that happens, and maybe we can talk about this later on too, is that uh, with the global food system, because there's so much that's kind of invisible to us, uh, it's prone to a certain kind of injustice. Because what's happening is, is that a lot of what's going on into making our food, uh, we don't see. Right? We don't see uh, the conditions in which animals are being raised. We don't see the conditions in which uh, uh, workers throughout the food system are kind of toiling. We just maybe see that kind of end product. And so this is the type of work that I do, is try to figure out um, you know, what is, say, uh, the cost, the lived cost of different food systems that we have. Uh, if some of you are familiar with, say, uh, the local food movement, I do a lot of work in what's called slow food. Uh, which is kind of the Italian response to fast food. And the way I sometimes try to uh, 
uh, maybe kind of understand what's going on is that if you follow my little demonstration here, I think what's happening, say, with the local food movement, if some of you uh, go to farmer's markets or participate in a CSA, in a way what you're doing is you're tilting this out a little bit, that you're trying to kind of see behind the scenes and kind of make those connections. And then the idea would be like in your lived experience, right? What is the enrichment of that type of uh, experience? What is it that it affords you in connecting with other people, with the food that you eat, uh, and then in terms of, your, of, of the meaning you ascribe to your own life? Um, but that's the type of stuff that I do. <laughs> All right, very All good. Right. Can I have the clicker? Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Campisi. <laughs> and again, we'll have, we'll have the opportunity to engage some of uh, this uh, a little later on again. But moving on into the criminal justice area. Go from uh, food to crimes. crimes. Yes. <laughs> Great transition. Um, um, I'm Madre Kynes, Department of Criminal Justice, School of Social Behavioral Sciences. Um, my angle on social justice in reference to the Marist College admission, um, multiple angles, if you will. Uh, when I was hired, I was hired as a correctional teacher and criminologist in, essential, uh, in the beginning, initially. Uh, eventually, I helped develop a class on race and crime that was a, lot, a lot of my seniors were taking and things like that. And I started to notice a current trend in the class that um, some of these students, if you will, were not culturally competent, if you will. Uh, things, statements such as, you know, well, colored people and these different type of statements that were, we had some work to do, <laughs> to say the least. Um, combine that with uh, Maris and the administration making moves for diversity initiatives, <clears throat> excuse me, and reaching out to me a little bit, I took it upon myself and I went back at the Maris mission statement. I tried to memorize it, but no. Even one sentence I would mess up. <laughs> Maris is dedicated to helping students develop the intellect, character, and skills required for enlightened, ethical, and productive lives in the, the global community of the 21st century. And I asked myself, you know, a statement more to myself, to live in a diverse community uh, in the United States, how can you be a productive citizen and not be culturally competent? And that's a question I really took sincerely to myself. Um, so uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Stacy Williams in psychology, we started digging into the literature. And we started seeing that, you know, particularly with, let me tell you something, you want to laugh. Everybody's an expert in crime, just for the record. You know, general public, everybody's an expert in crime. You can never talk, that's why I don't talk to my family. Everyone's an expert, everyone's an expert in race. You bring race and crime together in the classroom, you have the perfect storm. <laughs> just gonna lay, lay that out there. So, you know, we get into the videos, Eric Gardner, Freddie Gray, and it's, it's, it's intense. Okay. And so we, we dig into the literature and we found out that uh, on a national level, many college students would come in with misconceptions and they were graduating with the same misconceptions. So I took it personally, actually. Um, and I, we started to discuss this, Dr. Williams and I, and we started realizing that even at Marist sometimes, race, uh, social justice does not come up in the classroom a lot. Uh, sometimes it's brushed over. Uh, we've seen bias, we've heard of biases, not just here on a national level. Of, if a race comes up in the classroom, the professor might look at the only student of that race in the classroom uh, and things like that. And the students feeling uncomfortable and things like that. Um, faculty come to me and say, hey, how do you talk about this topic? You know, if you, had, you have any tips? You have any tips on the help? So we took it on ourselves to look into faculty preparation for teaching on social justice particularly. Um, and the literature showed a couple of things. One, uh, students come in with misconceptions, like I said, they leave with the misconceptions. Two, the classroom in itself can be a very emotional place that professors actually try to avoid the topic or talk around the topic uh, or make it very relatively brief. So we came up with a model, a theoretical model, if you will, to help discuss race at a predominantly white institution. Um, one of the first things we said you need to know and be aware of uh, is yourself. Faculty preparation, in essence, uh, know yourself. Um, and that's faculty awareness. We, we outline a couple of points. I'm going to go over each one in detail, but relatively briefly. Uh, you, have, you, have to, you have to have knowledge and education on the topic before you try to dive into it. You know? uh, particularly when people say, use terms in change. Like, there is a difference between black and African American. There is a difference between Asian and Asian American and things like that. But one of the biggest things I want to talk about for a second is this concept called experiential reality. And that's the idea of your experiences that you bring into the classroom and your biases as a professor that you bring into the classroom. 
And I always I have no problem using myself as a guinea pig in front of my students. And I'll tell you something, this happened literally two days ago. So about 15 years ago, my, my first race class, I used to take anonymous comments at the end of class. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was opening up Pandora's box. And I would read the questions. And it was a question that changed my life forever in the classroom. A professor said, uh, student said, Professor, if you're so big on equality, why do you reference the whole class as guys? <sighs> I went back to that, I said, they got me. I apologize. I acknowledged some of the sexism that apparently was in me, that it was socialized with. So this is what happened the other day in class. I said, all right, guys. And I hit myself in the head. And the students didn't get it. I said, what? I said I was told 15 years ago to stop saying that. They said, we don't see the problem. Even the female said, we don't see the problem. I said, you, know, you don't see the problem. I said, referencing the whole group as guys. I said, you know what? Let's do an experiment for the rest of the semester. I'm going to reference you in terms of female pronouns. I said, OK, come on, girls. Come on, ladies. That's what we're doing right now. And all the guys start turning beet red. Like, Can you stop that? I said, what's the problem? Come on, girls. Come on, ladies. Uh, and that's what we're doing right now. They're slowly adjusting. The girls are loving it. The, the, guys, the guys are slowly adjusting. But it's a bias. Just to even show you how much more of this bias is, even as much as I'm trying to be aware of it, uh, my wonderful dean one time, she doesn't even know this. It was a lesson she taught me. We are, we're hiring lines right now. Margaret, hey. We're hiring lines right now. He said, you know, it's hard to cover all these classes when we don't have human power. I said, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Why? Because every, every time growing up, you're, you're trained to say manpower, manpower. I said, human power, yes. I said, so it helps me in terms of awareness to always be cognizant of even racial, gender, heterosexual biases I may have. The second point we uh, <clears throat> point out is you have to know what your students are coming in with. You know, you have to understand their perspectives in terms of what they're coming at and how they're seeing things. Um, I, one of my goals is in terms of the classrooms is to make it okay to talk about race. You know, um, I, when it was, I will never forget it was a course where we were talking about it. And uh, I said, how many of you out there, and it was a trick question, it was, I threw a banana out there and half of them slipped. I said, how many out there reference to me, reference me as the black professor? And, and half of them started, they, this face, I said, it's okay. I am a black professor. <laughs> they said, I'm sorry, but I do do a professor. I said, but you're the same student that told me you don't see race. They said, oh, yeah. So it's this idea in terms of understanding sometimes the perspective they're coming in, the different angles that they're coming in. Even if a, per even if a student is a person of color, they can still have the same biases internalized inside of them that sometimes we have to work on and get out. One of the biggest things is a lot of resistance in the classroom when this stuff comes up particularly in race and crime, when this stuff comes up, because people might feel like they're, on a, they're being attacked. So a lot of defenses go up. Say, hey, I didn't do that. That happened a couple hundred years ago. Don't blame it. That was my grandfather. That was not me. You know? and, and in trying to understand and get them to understand that concept of privilege and how it affects them and how it affects all of us <clears throat> in terms of holding our system back in certain ways. Finally, uh, you can't have this without having facilitation skills. And that's something that a lot of individuals take for granted. How do you get this thing going? How do you manage the emotions? And even as well as I do my best, I've had students leave crying. I've had, I, 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 when I start the class, I say, leave your friendships at the door. I say, because you might lose some friends in here. Because when, you do, when I get the truth and people's perspectives come out, you have to be open-minded. We have to grow. So one of the things I do, because you always get, if anybody's ever taught or you've been in a class where race comes up, you get that quiet. You get that muteness. It's the same thing when gender comes up, how a man doesn't talk. And so race comes up, no, none of the whites talk. Well, that's a problem when you have 24 out of 25 white students in the class. I said, OK, so we're not going to talk. All right. So I had to develop ways to instigate it. And you know what? You know who can always get away with saying things? Comedians. <laughs> Comedians. So I use humor. Uh, I use humor to instigate it, to get the conversations going. One of my favorite skits of all time, if you've ever seen it, was Dave Chappelle, Clayton Bixby. The blind white supremacist. <laughs> the punchline, he's black. He just doesn't know he's black. <laughs> and I use that to help them work on the social construction of race and to get the, the conversation going, to get them feeling comfortable and things like that. But we came up with this model to help faculty, and more, more importantly, ourselves, particularly at Marist, uh, to be able to deal with social justice inside of the classroom, not just race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, ability, and things like that. So that's where our current, my current trend is at. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Connors. Uh, Professor Gapey, in terms of uh, engaging the larger community, civic engagement. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. And I'm pleased to be here to be able to talk about and share an opportunity have the opportunity to share a bit about my work as it relates to social change. And in preparing for this opportunity, I was reflecting on the, my, interdisciplinary, um, my interdisciplinary foundation. I come from public administration, which really benefits from lots of different perspectives about political science and sociology. And, and that tradition and field has really informed the way that I think about government and and social change. And particularly what is important to me in my work is this interaction between actors and in the context of governance and decision making, both formal and informal actors and the role that these citizens play in decision making. And when I think about social change, it brings up for me the importance of outcomes and the civic outcomes that we might see increased awareness and knowledge and the um, understanding of pressing social concerns, much of what we've heard on the panel so far, and greater civic participation, the public support for proposals and initiatives, and ultimately policy change that would come from the actions and the awareness that, that we've talked about. And as I've thought about the things I've learned over time and what's needed to achieve this change, it, I was reminded of um, something I learned in, in graduate school about the importance of actors, relationships, and resources. And that's really been this through line that's informed my career and the work that I've, that I've been doing. And it started when I was in Los Angeles in the, in the early 2000s. And I was fortunate to come into Los Angeles at a time where they were experiencing quite a lot of change. It, um, there was, I was a part of a team documenting the emergence of neighborhood councils across this huge city. And it resulted, these neighborhood councils were supposed to be a mechanism that would bring about greater voice in decision making in government. And that came as a result of quite a lot of advocacy and reform movements. I mean, 3.4 million people in Los Angeles and there were persistent threats of secession and people wanted to leave Los Angeles because the government wasn't responsive to them and, and that conflict needed to be resolved. And that social change and that justice that occurred through that advocacy left uh, the city with a new charter. And that was what was interesting to me. We got change, and now what? And that's really what is my kind of interesting through line, is how do we implement change that's come as a result of advocacy? And that's what I want to share, just a few, a story and a few lessons. Um, so this social change that came was um, needed capacity building. And it needed this intentional attention to implementation. How do we? create an opportunity for 3.4 million residents to participate in government. The charter gave very few, um, very few specifications. They just said every part of this city needs to be a part of this thing called a neighborhood council. And it can be as big or as little as you make them, but just go out and make them. How do you do that? And so what we thought we needed to do was build from the ground up these these organizations that um, were emerging. Some of these neighborhoods had existing civic ne networks and leaders that could really galvanize together and, and were off and running. But there were those neighborhoods that didn't have any existing resources. There had very few civic, um, scarce resources, civic networks that could pull together to develop these um, develop these councils. And so what we, what we thought we would do is build um, build a neighborhood um, leadership capacity building um, program. And we thought we would do it using an asset-based approach because what we recognize is that it's important to, we could come in and pretend that we had all the answers. And what we know when we have that approach is we often fail. And what we wanted to create was something that would recognize the resources and the assets that were present in that particular in that particular neighborhood, which may be very different than the assets and the networks that were in a different neighborhood. So we couldn't have a one-size-fits-all strategy when it came to leadership development. And we also didn't know everything. And we needed to also model and reflect that strategy of pulling together resources from lots of different places. So we assembled folks from across the city who 
had some information that could be used to facilitate the knowledge generation with these new leaders and put in, in a, a process that would kind of access for them the resources that existed in their neighborhood. And it was amazing and really interesting. It was a lot of hard work and we kept coming back to the drawing board saying, well, this didn't work, what can we do here? And that tinkering was something that we learned to do um, quite often and we didn't do it in our office back on campus, but we did it together with the neighborhood leaders. So that engaged leadership development process was something that became really important for us. And, and along the way, we were documenting it because we were practicing and we were tinkering, but we also wanted to be able to share with others what we were, what we were doing. And what we found is that by creating a space for people to come together and talk about the things that mattered to them, and to put a label on it called leadership development, people were willing to participate. They wanted to join that. What they didn't want to join was something called politics or political or this thing that, because the city had been a part of this really rancorous um, conflict and they didn't really want that. They were willing to be a part of this thing called leadership. And so we kind of got them into something they cared about and then they could also see how it would benefit to take in, have an investment in this other thing called neighborhood councils. And so that development process was really interesting. So for me, the lessons that I learned in that experience that I've continued to bring with me as I continue the work with community is listen more than you, than you lecture. That that process of listening can take a very long time and um, you gain a lot from listening to the folks around you. Um, think about the people that are at the table and ask who's not here. That process of inclusion and really expanding the circle is really important. And to start where you find them. That where, when we're talking about change, if we think that we need to be at 12, well, we might get disappointed. We might actually be at four. And the process just may take a, take a long time. And that leads with the final thing, is that this type of work takes a lot of requires a lot of patience and it's something that you have to know going into it it's not going to be what you expect at the outset and patience will get you a long way thank you thank you professor Jakey. and for our last uh, short presentation will be professor jocelyn smith well good afternoon it's indeed an honor to be here with you this afternoon to celebrate the inauguration of President Yellen and to discuss a really important topic on social justice. My social justice passions center around examining issues of trauma, violence, and loss among black boys and men. In particular, I examine the experience of homicide survivorship and work to understand how losing friends or family members to violence shapes the health and well-being and success of black males across the life course. For me, this work began in East Baltimore, where I spent a year and a half at a GED and Job Readiness Training Center, partnering with mental health clinicians to develop and facilitate a loss and grief group in the center. This group met weekly, and it's largely from these groups that I recruited 40 young men, ages 18 to 24, to complete in-depth qualitative interviews with me about their exposures to violence and their experiences of loss resulting from that violence. Um, I'll share some key findings from that research with you today, in addition to thinking through the implications of how we can advance social justice for this group. So some of you may be intimately familiar and others increasingly aware that homicide is a health disparity in the United States. It's the leading cause of death for black youth ages 10 to 24, and it remains the leading cause of death for black males ages 15 to 34. This disparity is largely maintained by social and structural inequities, such as residential segregation, poverty, racism, economic and educational inequities, and a host of other factors that public health scholars refer to as the social determinants of health. And together, these factors increase the propensity for violence, particularly in economically disadvantaged and urban contexts like Baltimore. However, this disparity simultaneously places young men at disproportionate risk for losing a friend or family member to violence and becoming hom homicide survivors. Uh, we use that term to describe the family members and the friends of homicide victims who face the task of living on after a loved one is murdered. Research that we have, which is limited at present, suggests adverse health outcomes connected with losing a loved one to violence. 
However, the experiences and the narratives of young men as homicide survivors, young black men in particular, are often overlooked and unnoticed. Um, how do young black men grieve? How do they process the pain? How do they cope, respond, and construct meaning around these experiences? And what resources are available to facilitate healing in their lives? These are some of the broader questions that uh, my program of research centers around. Today, I'll pr particularly share findings around two questions of the frequency and developmental timing of homicide death along the life course for this young group of men, and also to think through uh, what are the mental and um, health consequences of these experiences. So during the interviews, I had young men construct what I call chronologies of loss. I'd give them sheets of paper and ask them on one end to draw a line to the other end of the paper. The one end would represent the year they were born, the other end the present, the day of their interview. I'd ask them to go through and mark off all the years that they experienced a loss, and then specifically identify the losses that resulted from violence. So this is Wayne, a young man I call Wayne's timeline. Um, he's 19 years old. And across his experiences, which you can see he's had a lot of loss broadly to date, across these experiences, six of these losses were as a result of homicide death. Um, of these experiences, two, the ones that just darkened, um, were deaths that were reported to have occurred in the context of a police encounter. So making clear for us that um, our hope that the highly publicized cases we see, our exceptions may not be uh, the reality of the lived experiences of young men. I took these chronologies and I aggregated them to understand the frequency of homicide death across the life course for young black men. Uh, across the life course, and again, these are 18 to 24 year olds, young men reported on average experiencing three homicide deaths, largely peers. Um, and again, 10% of the participants knew someone who uh, was killed in a police encounter. Again, making real for us the reality of um, those experiences in their daily lives. In terms of the developmental timing of these experiences, the minority happened in early childhood, but these deaths increased during the school age years, with adolescence being a primary period and window of vulnerability of experiencing the first homicide death of a loved one to violence. These experiences also persisted into emerging adulthood. But again, adolescence was this primary window where young men talked about experiencing a clustering of homicide deaths. So in back-to-back -back months or in sequential calendar years, losing friends to violence, uh, not having the space to really process any one death before another was introduced. So how do young men describe these experiences and the impact on their lives? Antoine, who is 18 years old at the time of his interview, lost four friends to violence in the year prior to his interview. One of them happened in the context of a police encounter. And he talks about it being a disturbing experience. To one moment be interacting with a young person who's completely healthy, um, no serious illness threatening their, their life, um, and then the next moment having to find out that they have uh, been killed. And for him, it's, it's a constant negotiation of mortality and contemplating um, when he may be exposed to violence and also um, who else might be, be next in terms of preparing himself for losing another friend. He goes on to talk about this not only creating an experience of loss and grief, but also trauma and talking about <laughs> hypervigilance and the need to constantly be on guard, be on point as young men in Baltimore talked about it, preparing for that next encounter. However, it's important for us to also include in our discussions of uh, violence the context of, of policing and that Antoine talks about uh, not only having to prepare for conflicts uh, among peers, but also how it might happen in the context of policing. And so he says, yes, you have to be worried. Besides other people that you might have beef with or not like around there, you have to worry about the police. In a way, you can say that's scary, because at any time, they can uh, do whatever. They can hop out on you and just beat you for no reason. So you got to watch your back. Like, if I see police and they're riding past me, um, and they're just looking at me, slow riding, I'm gonna keep walking. But if I see them backing up, I'm gonna run because I already know what's on their minds. And I really appreciate Antoine's narrative because often um, we pose the interrogative of why run in the context of a, of a police encounter. But for Antoine, who's lost a friend to uh, violence in this particular encounter, he understands how quickly um, things can escalate to lethal violence. Wayne, whose timeline you saw earlier, when I asked him about his fears, he said, the police, that's like my number one fear in life. 
it's the police. All the stuff going on, it makes you fear. Like shooting, sometimes the police, they'll just beat you up, you know, or maybe because they couldn't find nothing on you. So, um, or maybe you might have said something smart or, you know, ignorant. They'll get the beating on you, knowing that you can't hit them back. You know, so no matter how you look at it, you're going to lose at the end of the day dealing with the law. So this research really helps us to understand how violence is a, a prevalent um, factor in the lives of, of young people coming of age in Baltimore, that adolescence is a primary window of vulnerability, but also provides us with an opportunity to consider investing in resources to facilitate healing in the lives of young people, and that safe spaces and safe people are really critical in terms of being able um, to provide outlets for young men to discuss and process the trauma that they may be encountering. Lastly, in terms of thinking about what we can do and thinking about our students and the messaging we can provide to them, well, one, it's important to include the narratives and the voices of young men in the research. Um, oftentimes, they're marginalized um, and their stories are not included. And so it's important to be uplifting the voices of young men in the context of thinking about trauma, loss, and policing. It also emphasizes the need of taking a trauma-informed approach. So being informed and understanding about the history and the prevalence of trauma symptoms and experiences in the daily lives of individuals and young men in particular. I think this is really important because a trauma-informed approach encourages us to shift the narrative from asking the question of what's wrong with you to what's happened to you. It brings context into the conversation, and it shifts the focus from perhaps looking at uh, marginalized young black men as problematic people and thinking about the context in which they're situated and how we can change the structural environment. And then lastly, we can be um, champions of policy that really advance social justice and um, are focused on creating safe spaces and healing environments for this group. So with that, I will um, turn the, the focus back over to, to Tom for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jocelyn Smith. Now, before uh, handing it over to some uh, questions from the audience, I, we had already discussed that we would take just a few minutes uh, to talk about how um, some of the research that's being done here it can get integrated into uh, the, the curriculum, into the classroom, uh, become part of the campus, the, the larger community of which you're a part. And actually, Brother Sean, when you mentioned that Marcelin Champagne, and I don't know if this was a direct quote, uh, his interest was less in doing research than in changing the world. Mm -hmm. And so I think that fits perfectly, this next part, in terms of how do we kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, Professor Conyers talked really about a classroom environment. So in, in that context, does anyone want to just uh, pick up how can we integrate some of these things? Maybe Professor Cambies wants to? Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, Mayor's students, as part of the core curriculum, uh, have to take an ethics class, um, which is taught in the philosophy department. It's a class I often teach. And what uh, usually happens in an ethics class is uh, students will do theory, uh, Aristotle, John Stuart Mill, Immanuel Kant, uh, and then they often do uh, issues in applied ethics, uh, euthanasia, uh, capital punishment, abortion. Um, and that's the a typical way that uh, a class will work. Um, and I, I, I teach a class like that as well. What sometimes happens with that way of approaching an ethics class is if you focus on issues like abortion and capital punishment, it sometimes uh, leads students to think that their everyday lives have no ethical significance, and it's only in these kind of uh, extreme situations that they're called upon to make a moral decision. Uh, so for a number of years now, through the honors program, uh, I've been teaching an ethics of food class. Um, and so uh, I see the benefit I see through a class like that is then to get students to see that you know, three times a day, uh, when you are uh, making choices about what you're gonna eat, uh, those choices have uh, ethical ramifications and if you just take about what I talked about uh, before, a lot of the food system is invisible to us. So what I'll do in that class is uh, just uh, we'll uh, do readings uh, about how the food system works. But uh, my class has kind of a civic engagement component to it, uh, where students go to organizations, uh, local organizations that have a food focus. Uh, so I have students who volunteer at the Catskill Animal Sanctuary, uh, where they work with uh, rescued uh, farm animals. Uh, I have students who work with uh, Rural and Migrant Ministry, which work with uh, farm workers in the Hudson Valley. And to just to get them kind of to see uh, everything that's going on to put that food on the table and to realize then how uh, that uh, kind of more immediate choice of what I'm going to eat 
has these kind of connections. And so for me, there's a very nice overlap between the type of research I do and then the type of dis uh, discussions we can have in the classroom. Okay. I'd also say that um, you could do it very practically in terms of third year abroad, try to reorient it towards Latin America, reorient it towards places in Africa so people could come to appreciate different cultures. If people are going to do an insertion experience with people who are marginalized, realize that marginalized people are not a category, they're individual people. Uh, sometimes I think we do tourism among the poor, is what I, I refer to it as. You've got to go and live and get to know people and appreciate that you will get more from that situation than you ever bring to it. So, but to me, it takes time, it takes energy, and it's, still, it's people to people. To me, that's what changes reality, it's what changes the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I think one of the biggest things, as I spoke about the classroom, is you know, really, in essence, changing the culture of the classroom. Um, there was an analogy I once heard, and I'm sure I'm gonna mess up the analogy, but you'll still get the point. Um, you know, diversity is inviting someone to a party. Multiculturalism is you know, asking them to dance. Inclusion is letting them dance the way they want to dance. And the point is that, um, and I relate, make a big point with this. I'm also, I work on a curriculum committee, and anybody knows who's sent proposals. I'm a syllabus expert now in so many words. <laughs> Look at everything that goes in the syllabus, but something came to me. Um, it was a professor in the School of Management, Dr. Tia Gaynor, and give her credit where it's due. Uh, she uh, penned a diversity and inclusion statement that she puts on the syllabus. And it's been passed along to me, should this you know, be recommended. I'm gonna read the statement to you and I'm gonna make a point after this. It says, in this course, we will challenge each other's thinkings, uh, thinking, excuse me, while working collaboratively to ensure that the classroom is a space of safety and bravery. Our classroom offers an environment where individuals of varying opinions, experiences, and backgrounds are able to be free to learn without fear of being silenced. Evidence of these efforts will manifest in readings, lectures, class discussions, seminars, and group projects. Aspects of diversity include, but are not limited to, race, ethnicity, color, nationality, sex, gender, gender identity, gender expression, class, sexual orientation, religion, age, ability, and veteran status. Now, if this, imagine this, if every professor put that in that statement on their syllabus and went over that the first day of class, and a student went through that for four years, that's 40 times they will hear that statement at the beginning of the class. That doesn't cause any money. That shouldn't make the professor feel but so uncomfortable, but it will gradually start to change the culture when saying that whoever you are, you are welcome in this classroom. You know, I don't know where that's uh, going to end up, but I know the Academic Affairs Committee yes. uh, on the campus right now is looking at that very statement yes. and uh, whether or not to make the recommendation that yeah, exactly what you describe. Every syllabus on this campus should have that uh, on, um, right from day one. Um, well, Professor Geike, you were, uh, uh, in, in the role you have here, you put students out there in the community and you work with faculty that do that. Absolutely. The I, was brought, I came to Marist to work with colleagues who were interested in community-based teaching and creating a center that would provide resources and support to those faculty who really wanted to engage their students in both the kind of exposing them to um, people, places, and problems, but also working at the other end for capacity building. And we have faculty who are working at all um, ends of that spectrum. And we've seen uh, there are 20 faculty fellows of the center who are engaging their students in a variety of projects. Joe mentioned his, and, and I think that that's an opportunity for both the faculty and the community partner to engage with the student and to create a space for, uh, for learning and, and not just uh, sort of re you know, retaining the information and giving it on a test, but really applying it and reflecting about what this means and how does it relate to what I'm learning in this class, but maybe my other classes. And that process of reflection is really central to the practice of community-based teaching and is something that we talk about in our community of practice that we have among the, the fellows who've, who've chosen to participate in this way. So mm -hmm. it's, it's new and growing and it's something that I find very exciting. Dr. Smithley? Yes, and so oftentimes um, I think it's a common experience for any of us, but, it's, but also for our students here, 
um, to move through life unaware of things that don't necessarily affect you. And so um, for me, it's really important to include uh, in the courses that I teach uh, readings that allow students to get connected to the lived experiences um, of other groups, in, for me, uh, as it relates to young black men in particular. And so in my, even in my intro to psych class, I incorporate readings um, on the work that I do um, or readings on larger social psychological processes like dehumanization, which is largely um, connected to what we see happening in terms of um, the broader issues of, of violence, particularly directed towards um, young black men. And so my students read these articles, but they also write course application papers where they have to apply course concepts to um, what they're reading about in terms of the lived experiences of, of um, young black men. Um, and also, I have a current student who I have Dr. Geki to thank for connecting me um, with her, Taylor Hamilton, who's completing an honors by contract with me in terms of research methods, where um, although that course is quantitatively focused, she's doing a qualitative project with me where she's spending time really reading these interviews, coding the data to understand um, even more the experiences of loss and trauma. And she'll be presenting that work in our class. So again, making the connection there and allowing the student to lead the way. Okay, very good, thank you. Now, as, as promised, uh, we have about 10 minutes or so that uh, we can open to questions from uh, the audience. There are microphones, which I presume are on, uh, <laughs> down here in the uh, front. Um, or you could call out a question. I'm sure we'll be able to repeat it um, effectively as the first question may be coming. Yeah. That might, uh, yes, sir. Um, as an alumni, and how has the college go rest, wrestle with the mission and the Maris brothers? do we get in today's politically um, charged environment? I had the uh, honor of marching in the gay parade pride with the first Marist this year. Yeah. Um, but when I look at us reaching out to the community, we are not as a community as proactive as some of the progressive people would want us to be. We mm -hmm. d don't have Marist students organized going to Black Lives Matter rally. I don't see you in the school districts. In Poughkeepsie, you don't have to travel to Africa to attack multi-generational poverty. Mm -hmm. But where, and just today came up again, um, 80 Syrian families are arriving. The Facebook with people on the board of Poughkeepsie saying, we have to treat our own. Where does Maris stand in that and join with Bard, Duchess, Vassar, the Interfaith Council, and say, we're going to embrace this? We talk mm -hmm. about Aleppo, mm -hmm. but where is, in the community are we standing out? And how, as a community of Maris, do we have these discussions? So instead of just teaching our future students how to be politically correct, we really do teach them how to live in a diverse society. So how does this, how's the college go and wrestle with those decisions in this political environment? Well, I, I don't know if there's any one person on the uh, platform <laughs> who can speak uh, in an official way, an authoritative way for all those things, but I would just like to point out a couple of things that you made reference to. I think ex some excellent points there in the role that a college and a college community should be involved in its larger community of which it's a part, and I would argue that Marist is. In fact, we are one of the founding me members of the uh, Refugee Project, uh, along with Vassar and Bart. Uh, and a few other institutions. So, uh, right in, in just the example that you've given in terms of that, and I realize there's a variety of political implications for that that you see now in the paper, but I think are, are very, very important. I think a component of it too can uh, be spoken to in what we are doing as part of the dialogue with our students, engaging our students, whether through the Center for Civic Engagement in which our students are actually going out in to work with Usually not-for-profits, organizations that don't have the resources otherwise to try to uh, self-sustain. So using the very skills that Marist students are developing in their majors to uh, help those institutions as well. But on that, and, and of course just the ongoing discussion that this is a part of. I don't know if, Brother Sean? There's also, uh, this is a small contribution, but Campus Ministry has 
a couple of hundred students out working in the community doing volunteer work. Now, someone could say, well, is it 5%, is it 2%? To me, you're attempting to take young people, sometimes whose world, quite honestly, has been rather small, and expand it so that people um, can get a, a broader view of reality and, and meet people. And I agree, you don't have to go overseas to do it. I mean, when, when I was a student here, we did a tremendous amount of volunteer work at the state hospital in the city. Um, and at that time, there was a deinstitutionalization occurring, so there was tremendous needs and, uh, that we had to respond to. But to me, no, I agree with you, to encourage and build upon what I think is already in place. I think the work you're talking about, but I think there are students out there. It's how do you motivate more students to think that broadly and so that you don't have a university that's not connected to the, to the um, community? Because I think Marist tries to pride itself on having, being in the community uh, by bringing people in we may need to encourage people more to go out, but there are, there are young people doing it in, in, I think, substantial numbers, if not significant numbers. Oh, yes, Kevin. Yeah. I just, just had a question. By the way, I love that line about rather than going to Florence, maybe go to the third world. That's pretty cool, actually. Huh. Spend a semester there. But my question is just, you know, new administration, everything coming in. I taught a few classes here in the late 90s, and then I've been adjuncting here the last few years. And, you know, I'd hand out those index cards, and everyone fills out a little bit of information. And the first day, you know, tell us about your career slugger, that kind of stuff. And I noticed a big change. There aren't many local kids anymore. There's very few kids from Dutchess and Ulster County. And I get it, IBM's laid off a lot, and you know, it's expensive college and all that. But all the dorms and so forth, I'm just wondering about Marist really being a presence right here. You're in the community, but are you of the community? And I thought that, uh, to me, that's a kind of curious question. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just seeing a change, and I thought I'd bring it up. No, that's a good point, and again, I don't think there's anyone here who can authoritatively speak to all of those things. But what I would say is along those lines, first of all, you're right in terms of the uh, kind of the uh, changing landscape of the Marist student population. When I, I'm also a Marist graduate, but back in the 1980s, two, more than half of Marist students were essentially commuting students. Now we're talking about maybe 5% of the student population commutes. I'm not even sure if, that's, uh, if it's that high. Uh, 55, 56 percent of Marist students come from outside of New York State now. So, and you know, seven, eight percent from California and the West and further Hawaii. So we are dealing with a much, but also a much more diverse student population because of that. I wonder too, and I'm, I'm going to go over the next question in just a second. There, um, to, to what degree, perhaps, do we have to even do a better job explaining some of the things that we are doing. I'm just thinking mm -hmm. of the Refugee Project, in which you knew the other members, but not that Marist was one of the founding members as well. Uh, the Center for Civic Engagement, which was recognized by the Princeton Review as one of the key elements of what makes Marist one of those 50 colleges in the US that is transforming uh, education and students, making students into better citizens. So these are very important components of things that are going on at Marist. We need more of that, more students involved, but I'm sorry. E even things like the Center for Lifetime Studies, you know, um, I go out there two or three times a year and I teach with, um, I forgot the requirement, I don't want to get myself in trouble with the age requirement, but older people <laughs> and, 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 and teach them a couple of times a year and they're right from the community and, they're, and it's a face, it's a presence and I've gotten grown quite a relationship with them actually. Um, and so there are things out there, sometimes I, I don't think those things are even publicized enough, if you will. So. And I would just add, I, I just really appreciate the questions that, are, that were just asked. And I think that many members of the community would pose the same question yes. in terms of um, in but of. Um, I had the great privilege last year, my first year here at Marist, of um, spending countless hours at the Teen Resource Activity Center connected to family services here in Poughkeepsie, um, building relationships with young people. There's an after school program that provides uh, drop-in services for, for young people provides them with a safe space to engage in recreation and to, to receive mentorship. Um, and I was also, through that process, able to, to bring Marist students, um, connect Marist students mm -hmm. to the program. And so uh, that was critically important. In particular, there was a teen resource, uh, teen dropout prevention program that was facilitated in part by um, Marist men's basketball here, a particular curriculum designed by student athletes or uh, coaches to be facilitated by student athletes. <coughs> 
And the main draw at that program is basketball for the young men who come. And so having our student athletes be able to go facilitate this curricula was really important because last year, um, a star basketball player in Poughkeepsie High School was, was murdered. And so having a presence there at that time was really important to provide um, support and encouragement to, to vulnerable young people at a time where they were really hurting and trying to process that pain. Um, I'm continue, continuing that work there, and as Dr. Geiki illuminated, it takes time to build trust. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to just be there, listen to what their needs were, understand, and also be able to lend resources was a big part of establishing that relationship. And look forward this year to uh, launching new projects um, based on our joint areas of concern, in particular related to, to trauma and violence locally. But just with, just with the point, I mean, if the both of you are raising it, it, to me it's an issue that maybe we have to talk more about with the local community because if, if there's a perception, and it's not true to clarify that, but if there's a, a reality that the college could be doing more, then I think it's something that would be good to dialogue with the community about, whether it's a community council to, to, to look at ways to do that because, I mean, the founding principles of the college was that it was always involved with the community and it was, it was a central part of the community. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't want that to erode over time, either in perception or in reality. Mm -hmm. I think. Very good. Yes, sir. Hi, I don't know if everyone can hear me. So um, basically what I wanted to ask is that how, with Marist becoming more diverse and we're trying to make everything inclusive here, the faculty itself, when something happens like a black teen is shot and killed, something like that, we, the students of color, do not hear anything from the campus itself. It, the school goes on as a normal day, but for us, it's not. We grieve with the, per, with the persons who have died and with that family. So it affects us personally, and we don't get to sort of get a moment to step away from that. Nothing is said from the campus, and most of the faculty itself that I've um, interacted with have gone through like a normal day, and it's not the same for us. So I wanted to know what is faculty doing to ensure that us students of color on campus who have gone through that type of experience, who is grieving through that, what are you guys doing to make sure that we are feeling like we, this is our community also, not just bystanders to the side? Mm -hmm. Ted. Well, that was a question to the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead. Ted, thank you for your question. Um, so just last week, I had the privilege of being invited by BSU to come and talk with them about um, the psychological toll of being exposed to the visible loss uh, of, and violent death of um, black Americans. Uh, on a, that happens on a daily basis, it seems like, just being inundated with that through social media, through news outlets. Um, and I know for me, right, I grieve along with you. Um, and in my classes, so for example, um, recently in the with the killing of Terrence Crutcher, um, I was having a really hard time dealing with that. Um, and I immediately felt pressed with how am I going to address this in the classroom because um, some students may be impacted and others may have no clue that this even happened. And it's a research methods class, so how am I really going to introduce this topic? Um, but that day we were talking about archi archival data. And so I used it as an opportunity to talk about the Guardian's resource where they've been chronicling mm -hmm. the, the homicide deaths of um, black men in the context of police encounters. Um, of all citizens of the United States, but in particular paying attention to those experiences. So we looked at that data, we understood how they started developing it, and it created an opportunity to talk about that, that this is happening and why is it important for us to be addressing it as researchers and as scholars. Um, so that's just one way that I've, I've done it. Um, but I think that it is important for us to be talking with each other, even as faculty, about how these experiences are impacting us and making sure that we acknowledge that it happens. I think the first a step is often acknowledging that this event happened to affirm the reality of, of the loss um, and then be able to, to create spaces for additional dialogue. And to build off of that, I know in our, my school of uh, social sciences, um, uh, the dean particularly as we have made efforts um, and we meet a few times a month now, faculty as a support group to help uh, be aware and how to discuss these topics and bring inclusion into the classroom. And I can comfortably say 15 to 20 faculty of our schools show up, and these, these are you know, white professors show up and learn um, to fill facilitation tips, skills on how to discuss this and be aware and think of it. But the truth of the matter is, is, is as humans, this is not to make excuse for anyone, if it doesn't affect you, a lot of times we don't think about it. You know, I, 
as a black male from the inner city, yes, it's culturally and emotionally taxing when I hear about these stories commonly, particularly in my position as being a criminal justice professor. So I'm a black male in the criminal justice system training for criminal justice professionals out there. So I have to balance multiple hats and multi a lot of emotions involved in this. Um, so a big part of it is bringing awareness and faculty also taking that responsibility to say, you know what, I'm going to be aware of what the students or even faculty reaching out. I've had faculty reach out to me. And when they do that, I give them a hug. You know, say, because we, we can, I don't have all the answers. I am, I, I do not have all the answers. I would never lie like that. But we can talk it out. We can work out things. We can figure out tips to help the students feel inclusive. If they're not aware of it, how do we make them aware? Well, how can we show that even as a white student that this black shooting, you know, of an unarmed, unarmed, man, unarmed man by the police force does impact your life also? You know, how to make that relevant? Um, and that takes time. But I think there are steps being taken for it. And the last thing I'll say is sometimes, um, I think we're frustrated because we want other students or faculty to recognize that this happened. Um, and so I learned, I took the risk the day after th that particular incident. When people ask me how I'm doing to say, not really, not good. You know, uh, a, an unarmed black man was killed today. And in order to, again, raise awareness and begin to facilitate that kind of dialogue. Um, and um, perhaps that was a risk I was willing to take. And maybe um, as we continue to do this work, there'll be a safer environment for students to take that risk too. I was a student here in the 60s, and uh, we had the Vietnam War, we had the killing of students at Kent State, uh, we had a great deal of social upheaval, and what we often did was we had what were called teach-ins, where we closed down for a morning, and students and faculty came together and talked about these issues. Did everyone come? No. Some people took it as a morning off, but a significant number came, and I think it, it helped people. Uh, everyone took responsibility, students and faculty, even to prepare together. To, to put some input into it, but it was very enlightening in terms of understanding the, the, the situation in Southeast Asia, uh, the role of the military who would come back from a war and, and, and be treated terribly in, in one way, and yet you had many people questioning the war. Uh, it, was, it was a very difficult time, but I thought we, we tried to address some very painful issues and tried to appreciate the different points of view that people had. Um, whether it could apply in the same way. To me, it was just very rich because people came together and really tried to understand one another and to struggle with issues. But it was, was simply shutting down for a morning. Uh, when, when Kent State occurred, we shut down for the day. Uh, it was the end of the semester. Um, final exams were actually put aside because people felt there was more to learn here and to try to understand um, than avoiding these kinds of issues and just pretending things weren't happening. I think it's an excellent discussion, but we're also going to be running short on time. And I think we have time for one more question. <laughs> Ms. McBride. Hi. Oh, God. Thank you. Um, so my name is Darielle. I'm a senior at Marist. Um, and I'm really glad that we're having this conversation. Um, I really do appreciate the fact that Marist takes the initiative to have these discussions. Um, it means a lot to students like myself. Um, and I think we're at a great place with um, President Yellen coming in. Um, it's an opportunity for us to be more innovative in our efforts to kind of promote this cultural competency. Um, but my question, took a lot of notes, but um, <laughs> my question is kind of how does Marist intend to improve like, community engagement like you guys have been talking about? Well, you all, gender neutral. You all, <laughs> you all have been talking about, but um, I think what's really essential is this larger idea of how we can kind of fulfill the Marist mission in terms of how we can encourage the future growth of our students. Um, how can we encourage them to be culturally competent? How can we um, you know, revolutionize our classrooms and our curriculum to the point where um, all students, not just students of color, have the ability to go out and be global citizens? And because that's something that I think has a lot of power to it and it's a real, um, it's something that you can't just say is in the mission and it's not actually happening. Um, that's just misleading to people um, who respect Maris as an institution. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of going around it a lot, but my question is how, are we go, how does Maris plan to kind of assess um, the success of his students in terms of the mission? Because the mission is to produce these globalized citizens, but you really cannot do that. I truly don't believe that it's possible if you don't have students who have the cultural competency to engage with others, to learn about um, 
the realities of other people. Everyone on the panel talked about that, and I, I noticed it as a theme, and I think going forward, that's something that administrators, faculty, students, our society in general has to consider. Um, we have to see the humanity in one another. Again, another theme you guys talked about. So uh, again, my question is kind of just like, how? how? I think I got the question. No, that was, that was a, a question for question. administration. It's a serious yeah. question, <laughs> but I, I really do want, I want to stress, I really do. I, I'm a senior, I'm leaving, but I will be very invested in Maris because I care about my institution like this, but I think it's important to assess how our students are going out and really able to even have those relationships and be globalized citizens. Dariel, thank you very much for that question comment, and, which I think is very, very important. And I've just been given the hook at the same time that uh, we, we really are running out of time. So what I would like to do is to take that in this context and just make one, oh, did you want to say something? Oh, I just, well, I, I really oh, Perfect. <laughs> I'm impressed you'll speak to the issue. I'm going to cut Tom off because I, I, I uh, the next panel, th this was a wonderful panel, and these are conversations we're going to continue for months and years ahead. But the next panel has put in just as much time and energy in getting their program ready. So I'd like to thank the group and we will close off on, on the note that has been raised through the series of questions and that Dariel has raised here that this is uh, something both to aspire to and work to. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, good. Very good.